finally, Oliver Rowland is a Formula E winner after a crazy qualifying session that saw all four champions on the grid start from the back. It was the Nissan Edam's driver who kept his cool to bag pole position and take his first ever victory in the championship. This is the Inside Electric podcast and I am your host, Katie Fairman. With me to chat through all of the day's action and the reaction to Oliver Rowland's win are Inside Electric co-founders Hazel Southwell and Rob Watts. And we're also very pleased to be joined by a very special guest, Mark Priestley. Mark, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Not a problem. Mark is a former McLaren F1 mechanic who's now a successful YouTuber, author and TV broadcaster. If you are a first time listener, we are an independent podcast covering Formula E and electric motorsport. You can find us on the socials at Inside Electric or online at inside-electric.com. Now there's a lot to talk about, but coming up in this episode, we'll have the reaction to Oliver Rowland's first Formula E victory. We'll be discussing the bizarre qualifying session, which led to a very mixed up grid. And we'll be taking a look at which drivers might have secured themselves a season seven contract after their performance today. Now, normally on these podcasts, we just dive straight into the race, but guys, we can't not talk about qualifying. Rob, can you tell us what happened? Why was it such an unusual qualifying session? Well, as uh, is is always the case in um, in Formula E, the 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 drivers going out in in separate groups, and uh, the drivers uh, at the top of the championship go out first. Uh, so we had um, Lucas De Grassi, uh, the, the recently crowned champion, Antonio Felix da Costa, uh, his teammate Jean Eric Byrne, and we had uh, Sebastian Buemi in that group. So pretty big names. Um, there was a little bit of confusion um, around um, the, the, the timing that they needed to, to, to leave to get out onto the track and set a, a fast line, a fast time for qualifying. And it looks as though they, they left it too late, basically, uh, which led to a little bit of a mad scramble. There was contact between uh, Degrassi and De Costa, and it was just a mess, really. And it ended up with... Um, all four of the champions failing to set a time and they they all had to start at the back of the grid which was good for the show but a bit of a a farce really um, overall for the championship but um, yeah and and it was a really bizarre session after that and we saw massive track evolution today Um, and we ended up with some really surprising names in in Super Bowl Um, it was a best ever qualifying for Robin Frines who started P2 Neil Jarney, who's had a terrible season, uh, was P3, which was astonishing. Uh, Rene Rast, P4 for Audi, his best ever. I mean, he's only been five races, but fantastic for him. Tom Blomquist, first race back after two years was P6. Um, it was just a very, very strange grid, really. and um, But it set us up really nicely for, a, for an exciting race. Yeah. Well, I mean, Mark, maybe you can shed some light on how does that even happen? How do teams like DS to Cheetah won the Constructors' Championship, literally the last race, and then they send both their cars out and both their cars miss the chance to qualify? How does that even happen? Yeah, it's, it's a horrendous <laughs> cock up is what it is, isn't it? It's, um, I'm really surprised, actually. I'm surprised that it happened, first of all, but I'm surprised with the teams that it happened with, because you're right, these are all you know, they're works teams, they are the leading teams, they're the teams that you would imagine are not going to make mistakes. And ultimately, it comes down to human error. And that's a sort of stark reminder, isn't it, that this is a championship that's all about technology, and we're all looking for the best car and the best kind of, uh, you know, energy recovery, energy usage, we're looking for to engineer the very best situation. But ultimately, it always comes down to, you know, a guy on a stopwatch or a guy inputting the right numbers into a system. And I'm really shocked and surprised how they managed to mess that up. And particularly on a, a weekend, it's not a weekend, uh, on, a, on an event. <laughs> <laughs> I keep doing that. <laughs> we keep doing that as well. Uh, yeah. Um, but on an event that's, that's so crucial, you know, these guys are all fighting for, all right, the championship might be done at the front, but there's a, there's a lot still to play for. The second place and, and, and further back, there's a lot still to fight for. So this was crucially important. I mean, they all are, but... When it gets down to the, the sort of the sharp end of a season, you know, you don't want to be making stupid mistakes like that. So really surprised. Um, I've kind of seen, we've seen, in fact, we've all seen this kind of thing before. But you think that would be, you know, one more reason that it shouldn't happen again. 
Definitely. And to add to the drama, Hazel, Lucas Degrassi, he was he was throwing a bit of shade, wasn't he? At especially the Tachita team, who said he said that he thought Tachita might have even done it on purpose to hold him up so he wouldn't set a qualifying time. Mm, um, <laughs> yeah. um, I I really like Lucas and I genuinely get on with him. He's one of the drivers I get on with best. So uh, when I say this, I say this with immense fondness. But Lucas Degrassi in disgruntlement shocker is not really like. You know, he's had a bad day and he's one of the drivers and there are a few of them in a lot of series and like God bless them because like as journalists otherwise we would not have a lot to write about sometimes if everyone was just like, well, I don't really know what happened and I don't want to talk about it. Um, but uh, yeah, he has a tendency to go off as, uh, as you refer to it on the internet um and he did um he felt that because both to cheetah cars were released so late and that they must have known because they were honest they he felt that they knew they'd missed the checkered flag before it was definitely true that he had um which is all very very marginal but he felt that because de costa and jeff had both overtaken him on the outlap that he was being blocked. To be honest, I think they were all trying their best to race to the checkered flag because they knew they had fucked up. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the the team would have been telling them on the radio. It wasn't the kind of marginal case like uh, Evans in... Where was it Evans missed the checkered flag this season? Oh, I can't remember, Marrakech? but I do remember. Um, yeah. But it, it's... Oh. <laughs> It, wherever it was, it was quite warm. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, like there's been a few marginal cases and, and that seemed like incredibly, and the team were telling him he was safe and he wasn't at all. He, need, he needed to get to the line faster. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a weird error to see from those teams. But to be honest, if you're playing chicken with who's going to be outlasting group one, very occasionally this will happen. Um, we've never seen it happen on a scale quite this wide and with, you know, with all four of the currently racing champions, like as somebody pointed out, Nelson Pico Jr. from the commentary box said it's exactly the same qualifying time as all of them. Um, so <laughs> a, a clean sweep for the champions on even numbers. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's not the kind of operational area you expect from Diaz Chichita, but on the other hand, they're probably knackered right now. Mm. Um, I know I am. I think the thing, the thing to point out, we should point out the reason they were doing it, of course, was because this, this is a the circuit evolution, particularly at this circuit and particularly on this new layout, parts of it we've never even driven on before today. So the circuit evolution was always going to be great. So whoever went last was likely to get the, the faster uh, conditions. But they left it so fine that I, I reckon even if they hadn't started interfering with each other, it would have still been really tight to get round. So why you wouldn't just give yourselves a bit of margin and, and I mean, it's cost them all dearly in the end, of course, so not, you know, it wasn't worth it at all. If it was me and I've sat in, in garages in the past where my engineer, as a mechanic, when my engineer has talked about putting, you know, half a litre less fuel in a car because it might make the car a bit lighter and, and you're thinking this is getting really close to a limit and if, if we have, you know, not enough fuel to get around the race or around the lap or whatever, we're going to look really silly and that's basically what happened today. Yeah, it's the equivalent of being caught out with nothing for your fuel sample or whatever. Like, it's, yeah. it's just like, well, you took a gamble and it completely did not pay off. Like, mm. um, and I think, you know, Lucas can go off on one, but that was not where the Tachitas wanted to be. It definitely wasn't where Buemi wanted to be. You know, they all went for... And I think, I think the reason that there's friction is possibly... If everyone else had gone out in the first four minutes and then there was only one of them trying to take that out lap, then they they might have been all right. But to be honest, I mean, their qualifying laps would have been horrific anyway because they would have been going around four wide. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. the second you had the four of them together, that was over. So mm. they, would have been, they would have been at the back regardless because their times would have been so crap. Yeah. And we even saw Degrassi try and fight past DaCosta to get through, uh, which caused a little clash between the two of them and, and damage to DaCosta's car. But as you said, none of them set a time. They started from the back of the field, which, like you said, Rob, not great for them, but great for the show <laughs> um, and great to see them 
fight their way up. But let's go and chat about the actual race itself. We mentioned, obviously, it was a comfortable win for Oliver Rowland, who won the race from pole. Um, he looked strong on energy consumption today and kept France at bay throughout. Guys, I'm sure that you're all super pleased for Ollie Rowland. Yeah, fantastic for him. <laughs> he, he came close a few times last season. Um, probably should have won at least one race last season. Uh, I remember in Paris, he, he put it on pole and then binned it. I think it was at the end of lap one, didn't he? Um, and it, it does feel like uh, coming into this season, if, you, if, you, if we'd have spoken at the start of the year, um, who, who's going to be the next driver to get their first win? I think Roland probably would have been a name that we'd have, we'd have spoken about. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's been an interesting season for Roland because last season he was absolutely supreme in qualifying. He hasn't quite been that on it in qualifying this year. But today, you know, he, he's had an absolutely stellar day and, and he looked really comfortable today. Um, he, he seemed to have a little bit more extra usable energy when it counted. And Robin Fryens, as much as he's had a really strong race, he, he didn't really look like he was going to put Roland under serious threat for that win. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased for Roland. I, I think this is a justification of, of, of his, um, his talent and his potential that he's shown. Yeah. Mark, are you in agreement with that? Yeah, totally. I think he, he executed it brilliantly. Obviously, qualifying was great, you know, to, to be able to do what he did. But executing the race, I mean, he couldn't have done much more. He broke the gap at the beginning just to, to break away from, from Fryens just a little bit. Because if, you're so, if, if the, the chasing car is so close, then that chasing car potentially has an advantage where you can start to slipstream and save a bit of energy. But he broke that gap, meaning that you know, Frins lost the, the, the advantage behind and then he could settle into his own race. And he actually even said it himself. He did a really good job in the early part of managing his own energy so that he never really felt under pressure and felt like he still had a little bit left in the, in the bag, if you like, if he ever needed it, which in the end he didn't. Yeah. And I mean, like you said there, Frins really struggled to catch up to him, which especially compare it to the previous race. So we had all the top five, all within like two seconds of each other. That's just... There were no safety cars this race. This is the first race at Tempelhof that hasn't been a safety car. So I yeah. think that was partly how Roland was able to get that, that security of the win. So like, I, I don't think what we're seeing, because the... Ch 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 <laughs> no one can say um, it. It's the heat, isn't it? <laughs> is so fast relative to the other cars and, and does have high efficiency. But I think the reason that we weren't seeing them pull away a lot of the time, like if we'd had a Tachita in Roland's position, I think we would have seen a big, big win margin. He actually only had two seconds at the end. So, you know, when we're talking about a comfortable gap in Formula E, we're talking about like the kind of thing where people would be like, oh, wow, yeah. um, in form Formula One. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah. And in in the standings, I mean, it just shows how close. Although De Costa sealed the drivers' title, how close it is uh, for second and even third position. Because Ollie Rowland has gone from P nine to P two in the standings after that win today, and obviously it's an important victory for Nissan, who had their twin power uh, twin motor powertrain ban last season. Um, and especially, although Boemi was able to fight up positions in today's race, you know, with Boemi. They had one guy starting at the back who didn't even set a qualifying time, another guy who started on pole and then won the race. So a bit of a mixed day for Nissan. But um, Rob, do you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, why that was such an important move up from P9 to P2 for Ollie Rowland, especially with his competition stuck at the back of the grid? Well, yeah, it's been, it's been um, <clears throat> the last sort of five races um, obviously have been, the main talking point has been the, the, the championship and to Costa and, and um, but behind that, it, it's a really fascinating um, battle for P2 in the championship. And it, and it seems to be changing every single race. I think um, didn't, um, I'm sure they said on commentary that, so Roland jumped from P9 in the standings to P2, but didn't, um, didn't Gunther do the same thing as, as well the other day? Cause he was P9 yeah. and jumped up to P2 yeah. it and it is, just yeah. shows how, how, close that is and even now going into to, to one race tomorrow after what we've seen today honestly like I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't really be massively confident of saying who is going to get sort of second third in the championship because 
it really does depend at the moment who turns up and, and, and sort of puts, puts the day together. And uh, we, we've seen some wildly inconsistent performances from some of the guys uh, in the sort of top 10 in the championship. They'll, they'll win or get a podium and then the next race they're like 14th. So it, it's very difficult to predict. But yeah, that gives him an, an enormous chance now. And in all honesty, I, I think at the start of the season, if you just said to, to Ollie Rowland, you, you'd be going into the last race of the season um, with a chance of being runner up. I, I'll be honest, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have believed that. And I, I don't think he would have. But um, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been a productive uh, week and a bit in Berlin for, for Nissan, I would say. Hazel, you sound a little bit um, disagreeing there with Rob's comment. <laughs> I think um, Roland was really disappointed. So, like, I did a podcast with him um, a few months back now, at the start of yeah. lockdown. Um, and he was, he was really frustrated and disappointed with his results at the start of this year. He felt like um, Nissan, although they had had this sort of, the setback with the the dual MGU being um, prohibited, um, they had always kind of had a plan B because they sort of thought it might happen mid season last year actually, uh, or last season. Um, so although the team had sort of like had to balance a few things, it, it wasn't quite the blow that it looked necessarily like. Um, and I think uh, last year Roland. If he did anything, it was good because he joined so late, stepping in for Alex Albon, literally mid preseason testing. Um, that, like, you know, I, I think by and large the expectations were were sort of that he would put in solid time. And then this year he was really ambitious. Um, you know, he he had been competitive with Seb last year, which is big, like because. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you're a relatively new Formula E fan, you won't necessarily see this, but Seb Buemi is the most successful driver in Formula E history in terms of race wins. Um, he's a real titan, and you know there were seasons in the past where people were like, "Oh, well, I guess Buemi is going to win it again," um, like week in, week out, in a very similar way to the way that we perhaps talk about other single seater series. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think. You know, Roland was very ambitious. He was really set back by the massive crash he had in Santiago. Mm. And he's talked about this a little bit, but but like basically he lost a huge amount of confidence because he had a like a big one. Um and that sort of knocked him quite a lot. Um and and then he said, you know, he was just getting it back in terms of momentum when the season stopped which is a very difficult thing to then come back from but but like maybe these rapid fire races what you're seeing is him having the ability to have enough track time to to kind of put that to bed and and now you're seeing sort of like a more representative roland emerge yeah anything else you want to add mark well i was gonna say i think that's um that is absolutely true. You know, the, you know, we're all humans and the racing drivers, although sometimes we, we put them up on some kind of pedestal, they're still humans as well. And they're affected by, you know, confidence levels and things like that. So the big shunt, you're absolutely right, would have knocked him for six. And, and it takes some time to come back from that, which is also why today was so important in terms of this championship, because his confidence level is now way up here somewhere. And yet we've got another race tomorrow, which could seal him second in the championship. So you know, it can work both ways. And, and this rapid fire run of races in Berlin, if it's gone well for you, you know, it's the best way to go. You just want them to keep coming thick and fast. If it's not going well for you, you, you just want it to be over as quick as possible. So, you know, they're all affected in different ways. But for, for Ollie Rowland, today has, has, you know, done wonders for his, for his own self-confidence and therefore he'll carry that, carry that straight through into tomorrow as well. Yeah. Well, we've talked a lot about Roland and then obviously Robin Freintz, but let's talk about that third position on the podium. Now, we discussed before, Neil Yarny made it into Super Pole, which is just astonishing, like looking at the season that he's had so far, and he put it in third. Um, and for the first half of the race, he managed to hold on to P3, but then lost out to Lotterer in the second half of the race. 
Um, and then Lotterer found himself battling Rene Rast, which is Audi's new recruit after they let Daniel Apt go over the lockdown break. Um, and wow, what a final lap battle for P3. It was under investigation, um, which we now understand that no further action is going to be taken. But um, Rob, do you want to talk us through that last lap battle for P3? Because it was certainly spicy. <laughs> Yeah, it really was. Uh, but <clears throat> I have to say, I've been really impressed by René Rast. Um, not just today, but since he's come in, I think he's he's adapted quite quickly because it's a big ask to come into a championship mid-season and especially Formula E. And um, today, you know, he was quickest in, in group qualifying. Yes, OK, fair enough. There were a few names, um, you know, down the back of the grid. And there was, as Mark has said, that, you know, there's quite a lot of track evolution, but... He's out qualified Lucas Degrassi three to two in, in the five races together, top group qualifying, held his own. Uh, you know, he was running comfortably sort of in the top five for the majority of the race. Um, and then he saw his opportunity uh, later on, got got past Johnny, and then it was a sort of a, a, a battle then between him and Lotterer for that last position. But Lotterer admitted afterwards that maybe he'd. Um, left himself a little bit to do because he he was a little bit shorter than Rast on usable energy in those last couple of laps. But that move, I mean, that was robust. <laughs> that that was that was punchy, uh, and and he almost saw that podium. Was like, I'm having it. I, I'm absolutely having it. I, I don't care uh, what happens. I'm going for this, and that is the sort of thing that gets you that gets you a contract. And um, but I just want to add on Rast as well, because I spoke to him before Berlin and I said to him, like, what are your expectations? Because it is very difficult to come in. And he said, look, you know, I, I'm real, uh, realistic about this. I don't expect to be on Lucas's pace to begin with. Um, but all I want to see from myself is progress. And, you know, if I can score some points and by the last race, I'm in a position to, to contribute, then I'll, I'll be happy. And I think that's exactly what he's done. I think each race he's gradually looked more comfortable and today uh, it, it's all come together for him. So I, I think he's really given himself a fantastic chance now of, of staying in that car for next season. Yeah. I think, I think for a, a rookie as well, this run of races is the best way to, to come into the sport, isn't it? Because you do get them, you know, keep coming. So the, the rate of learning is probably far more rapid than it would be over a much more normal season. So I agree with you. He's built every time on every every event and every outing in the car. He's built on that, and yeah, it's, it's a, he's done a really good, solid job. I thought that today, the the last lap pass, that as you said, it was under investigation. In any other championship, that's a slam dunk penalty, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but in Formula E, probably. that's exactly what these cars are built for, and and it's what the what the the championship kind of thrives on. So you do have to drive a little bit differently in this championship to to many other single seaters. That's something else that drivers have to. Um, you know, adapt to and get used to. But I'm really pleased the stewards let that one go because whilst, you know, the, the pure racing fans, if you like, Formula One fans would think that's not racing. You're not allowed to do that. That is Formula E racing. It's one of the things that makes it so entertaining. Yeah. I think also like Formula One fans, if Formula One cars were allowed to race like that, people would be well into yeah. it. Yeah, totally. Always like, oh my God, let them race like that. But they can't because the front Absolutely. And, and like whatever. And the the tyres pop and you know um uh but I, I mean i i would say i personally think that the clemency for rast on that was purely on the fact that lotterer had less energy and maybe should have conceded um because the decision was that nobody it was robust race or hard racing between the two and neither was predominantly at fault but not that there was nothing wrong with it um so i uh... well yeah i mean if you're if you're being harsh on rast you can say he was quite punchy maybe on the line but also you could easily say if you're critical of lotterer i don't know how you feel about doing that uh hazel but if you are um if you are going to well, be critical i've, I've actually lotterer, got some notes to talk about this later okay <laughs> um you could say that maybe lotterer would have been wiser to just not take the risk and, and just maybe concede i don't know how how much he felt he he could have hung on with his energy but um he could have he could have quite easily ended up you know losing more than just that 
the podium. But I mean, who cares? It was great to watch. I enjoyed it. <laughs> who cares? <laughs> right. I mean, it, it doesn't matter to me. I've got I've got no stake in it. So I just. <laughs> You just there with your popcorn enjoying it. Yeah, loved it, loved it. <laughs> so before we move on to other drivers that have had good days and bad days, what do you think? Do you think the move was fair? Are you in agreement that no driver should be penalised, Ross shouldn't lose his you know debut FE podium? I'd be oh, disappointed I, I, if he did. Yeah, I think so. For the reasons I said, is that you know that would kind of set a precedent, which at the moment doesn't really exist in Formula E. The the precedent in Formula E is that. You know, we say Rubbins racing, it really is in this championship. And um, I think the, the nice thing about it is that all the drivers know that. They know the cars are a lot more sturdy and can take it. It's a little bit like touring cars, isn't it? Where you're allowed to sort of knock each other wing mirrors off and you're allowed to rub each other and that's totally fine. But if you're in Formula One, the slightest of contact and there's a penalty. So you do have to apply different rules or different penalties, different judgments to different cars, and different championships. And I'm for me, it was uh, it was a, it made the last lap, didn't it? Made it great, made it entertaining. The sport's all about being entertaining, so uh, I'm pleased they let it go. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And as you've said, you know, Ras doesn't have a contract yet for next year at Audi. You think today has just sort of cemented that, or do you think there are still other people that could be in contention for that Audi seat, both maybe in Formula E and out of Formula E? Hazel, do you want to uh, start? I, I think there are definitely other people who could be in contention for that seat. Yeah. Um, Daniel Apt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's back, maybe. Um, uh, no. Um, uh, yeah, Tom Christensen is... Uh, no. Um, uh, the, uh, I think um, that that seat will be something that really isn't decided until quite late. Um, there will be a lot of, um, uh, was it you interviewed McNish, Katie? Yeah. Like when, yeah. when he was talking about, and this was prior to Daniel Abt's, um, departure <laughs> from the team. Um, but he was talking about, you know, how they selected Daniel to be the driver again, um, and brought him in as an Audi factory driver when he hadn't been. Um, but, uh, like the um it, one of the things he said was that uh, it was about how the way the driver worked in the team and there's a tacit kind of how they work with lucas um uh, because although raster's obviously shown that he can do stuff that was a very unusual formula e race like we have mm -hmm. to regard this as like the equivalent of sort of a wet f1 race or something where something weird happens because so many of the the fastest cars were taken out of contention um and and completely out of contention because not only did they all not set qualifying laps but they mostly got entangled with each other and and ended up in incidents and da costa didn't even finish and like you know um so yeah i think i think rast has made a very good case for himself but it will come down to all kinds of factors and and you know they i don't think it would be inconceivable that audi go outside their own stable but they do also have a driver who came second today um <laughs> who i don't know the status of his contract with envision virgin because i believe his contract is with audi so well virgin have conf confirmed frines and cassidy but i mean like like you say if his contract is with audi then obviously that that could change but w when they confirmed cassidy they they did say to partner frines so and and I, I i also i did think before um you know when apt um um left the team I, I did think that maybe Frines might have been in contention for, for maybe this season. Um and 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 he's had he has had a tremendous run of races recently. Um so I mean like you say, it depends on, on, on how how much that contract is on the Audi side and how much of it's on the Virgin side. Um I, I but think I think Rast has done himself no harm. 
Yeah, I think you also have to consider Rast at this moment has no prior beef with Lucas, whereas uh, Freins and uh, Degrassi have, have had a couple of disagreements. Um, so uh, Freins is younger. That's only the case for Rene because he's been there two minutes. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> five races in. <laughs> what yeah. um, I, I think I think whilst you have a Degrassi who you know has this incredible record in Formula E, if he can continue to perform at a Degrassi level and uh, especially outperform a car that you know, because France had ten points coming into Temple yeah. Hall, like he had a shocker, time, you know, um, and and that wasn't necessarily his fault, but nevertheless, like if you want a machine like Lucas to just turn in podium after podium after podium after podium. Um, then whilst you still have Degrassi, you probably do have to make the team about him. Whether he gets another driver's championship, I don't know. Um, you know, he just turned 36. Um, but which I'm not saying is immensely old. <laughs> I, want to be I was going to say. That's um... a spring chicken. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um Eddie on uh you know um they in the meantime you know france just turned 27 or whatever so like they they can wait for that to be their their main lineup and i think well i, I actually remember speaking to lucas in valencia in pre-season and he said um that he has he has no plans to race in any other series and he will see out his career now in formula e and he said, I'm pretty sure he said he thinks he's got another two or three years left. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously now, I mean, we've seen this in Formula One when you've got a, um, you know, a top team that's got a, a driver who you know has got two or three years left. The team will already be starting to think about a contingency plan for when that driver moves on. And for when Degrassi does leave Audi, you know, it, it'll it'll be big for them because he's been with them every single race that Formula E has ever had. He's, he's been in that team since since day one. So, and he was of course employee number one in Formula E. So, um, I'm sure they are looking not just at next season, but they're and, looking. And then he'll be the head of the FIA. So, well, yeah, yeah, I look forward to that. <laughs> I look forward to him weighing in on um, driver penalty decisions and. Uh, <laughs> How much influence, if, if any, do you think Lucas might have over his teammate at Audi next year? Do you think he's, that, he's got that much sway within the team that he can uh, steer them in a certain direction? I, think I would he imagine he, he does. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I would say he'd at least have some reasonably significant in, uh, you know, influence in that area. I would imagine so. He'll be doing team building exercises with like, all of the candidates to see which one he gets on with best. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about somebody else who we mentioned briefly before, Neil Yarny. Obviously, he's had a shocker of a year so far. And he's with uh, Porsche, which, you know, Andre Lotterer, Hazel's number one fan. Um, <laughs> he had some good results with Porsche, obviously, like podium on the debut. And unfortunately for Yarny, it's just... It's not worked out for him. Yes, he had the P3 in qualifying today, but it really just fell apart his race in the second half. And he lost um, his positions to Lotterer, then to Rast, and then to Alex Lynn. Um, can you see Porsche holding him on for next year, or are they going to look for another drive? Obviously, there was the possibility people thought that maybe Evans would make the jump from Jaguar to Porsche, or Hazel, what are you... Do we think that Porsche will hold on to Neil Yarny, or is this a case that tomorrow is likely to be his next race and then he's sort of gone? Mark, what do you think? I, I, I think he struggled not just, you know, today, but he struggled with Formula E, if we're really honest, hasn't he? He struggled to adapt to Formula E. He's a, there's no doubting he's a talented driver, but actually we've seen quite a few talented drivers over the years come in and yet not be able to get to grips with this sport because it is quite a unique driving style. It's a quite a unique in terms of energy management, very different to the kind of racing that most drivers kind of grow up with. Uh, and not everybody can, can deal with that. I think for some reason, he's not been able to do that. So my feeling is that he's, he's not going to be good enough for Porsche um, moving forward. They're a big team putting an awful lot into this. They want results. And he's not been able to, to deliver enough of those. So, so then you start looking at who else could come in. And um, 
you know, there's a number of drivers outside of Formula E. I mean, Nico Hulkenberg was talked about coming into Formula E with Jaguar. He was very close, I believe, last year, um, potentially out of a drive and looking to go racing again. So, so he's there. There's others outside. But, you know, what, what we've learned over the years is that if you can take a driver with Formula E experience, you've already got a massive step up when you when you hit the ground running in the new season so i've dodged that question because i've I've got no idea who's going to fill that seat but i'm going to say it won't be uh, neil yarney no well i mean there's been lots of talk about pascal verlein who obviously departed mahindra um prior to us racing at tempelhof for these six races um hazel what's the likelihood that uh pascal verlein is going to take that second porsche seat I mean, it's it's the sort of folklore <laughs> certainty that Verline <laughs> takes that seat. Uh, equally, I don't know who signed what, um, or if there's been any ink involved whatsoever, um, because uh, Verline's split from Mahindra was based on the fact that he was speaking to other teams, not um, on the fact that he had signed. Um, and it was an amicable split, but nevertheless, like, you know, as far as we know, Porsche will probably announce him on August the 16th. Um, but, you know, there's, well, Johnny has had a, a very rough year. Um, I think, you know, Porsche came into this endeavour with, almost no one in their team, almost no one in their team who had any Formula E experience whatsoever, mm. which is extraordinary. Like Mercedes, you can look at and be like, well, at one point Van Dorn was leading the championship and De Vries has even like chucked in a couple of good results. Um, but uh, they have had a scrappy, messy year. They, they're certainly not operating on the same way that, that some of their other motorsport teams do. Um, but like... Uh, or not operating on the level. They definitely shouldn't operate in the same way. It was a very different thing. Um, uh, but um, the uh, the Porsche gamble of taking essentially their whole LMP1 team and chucking it into a Formula E team and then trying to behave as though it was an LMP1 team has sort of been a, a, a like... <laughs> a little bit funny watching history repeat itself in the same way that when Audi took over Ab Schaffler, who were one of the most operationally successful teams in Formula E, they let Franco Ciacchetti, who was probably like the leading engineer that you most wanted, wander off to Mercedes and didn't like just move heaven and earth to retain him. Um, and then spent the first half of their first season of a, uh, as a factory team, completely clowning. They lost their first win. They screwed up Lucas's car so badly he couldn't use it for most of the time, you know. Um, and I think Porsche have only been disguised in doing the same thing um, by the fact that uh, they had no prior record, unlike with with um, uh, when Audi came in, where because they'd taken over Ab Schaeffler, they were the reigning drivers champion. So there was a little bit more kind of comparison and, and you could say like, well, they used to operate like this and now, now they're clowns. Mm. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know for certain that Verline's going there. I mean, he, he probably is. I, I, I would say there's a significant question mark about how long Porsche will probably be in Formula E as things stand. Um, because right now it's not working out for them as a Porsche endeavor. And I'm not 100% sure that they as a company know how to, similar to some other marks like Ferrari, they don't necessarily know how to adapt themselves to being not the way that they operate. And currently I'm not 100% sure that they're a company that knows how to be a winning Formula E team. Um, and you know their their best driver is thirty nine. Well, that that's another point. I mean, they they're, they're going to replace Johnny, but you know, in, in a year, two years max. In, in all honesty, I, I, they're probably going to have to be looking for a replacement for Lotter as well because they can't see Lotter racing into his 
forties. And you know, whilst Lotterer has Heidfeld. been no, he he is no Nick in Nick Heidfeld. Um, but you know, he, as good as Lotter has been, and, and as good as Porsche has been in in these bird in races, um, it it does feel like maybe they've kind of I wouldn't say lucked in into these results, but that they've hit the ground running and they've been able to 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 pull something out of the bag. But before this, the, you know, their season was quite scrappy, and it didn't look like they were going to be anywhere near the sort of top six in in the championship um but yeah who knows porsche they're a bit of an interesting one and that they also from our experiences this season of working with them and, and the time we spent with them in pre-season they're they're a very different outfit to a lot of the other teams even the other german teams their approach is is very um what's the word i'm looking for it definitely shows that they are not used to operating in Formula E and that they have not overall spent a massive amount of time in the Formula E paddock. Basically, all of us in Formula E intermingle all the time and like because everyone sits in the same flipping places and like um it, obviously there is a separation of like media and drivers when you're having lunch. Um but pretty much we're all wandering around the same five hundred meter square, you know bar a couple of tents um and Porsche uh, I felt like they were not ready for even the physical landscape of Formula E like they, yeah. they they've been very sort of like here's our very formal press conference it operates as though it's it's either a big automotive thing like the Geneva Motor Show or like a Formula One announcement. So I, I, I'm not even sure I can really. It, it's it's almost too old school even for for F1, which is a weird thing to say. Um, uh, but like it's, it feels like they're at the same time as they were like, we're going to launch our car on Twitch, and I was like, oh, that's actually quite cool. Um, they sort of have been the most conservatively rigid team in terms of the way that they've approached a lot of stuff and. That it's quite difficult to get stuff out of them, which, like, obviously, as a journalist, I'm yeah. just like, um, uh, but because uh, you know, we only have a limited number of race meets a year, and, and particularly at the moment, it's like, for God's sake, just give me stuff. Um, like, do you want me to write about you or not? Um, but it, it feels a bit like they're operating on a level where they're expecting us to earn the right to cover them or like there's there's a sort of like there's sort of gatekeepering thing going oh that that's a bit too harsh but there's there's definitely a kind of there's, there's almost like of, an exclusivity there's a sort of performative bougie thing going on that definitely isn't very formulary <laughs> yeah. yeah i think it is, I it is so true isn't it because it, 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 it's the same thing as a driver coming in who may have won in every other championship that doesn't mean anything when you come into Formula E. And I think the teams have to sort of work in the same way. So you, you know, I don't want to use the word arrogance because I haven't spent enough time with Porsche to say they're being arrogant. But coming in and not, you know, being the rookie, which is what they are. They're a rookie team, essentially. Uh, I'm surprised. And I'm also surprised because didn't they have some, I know it wasn't a very harmonious relationship and didn't last very long, but they embedded a few team personnel engineers at the Dragon team, I think, didn't they, a while they ago? Did. And that all ended badly. Um, yeah. they, had, they had some experience. You know, they had the taste of it, but they just yeah. haven't adapted. Um, and I, I do think it's, um, it's surprising for a team of the stature or an organisation of the stature of Porsche to not have looked... They must have looked at Formula E for a couple of years before they actually set foot in the, you know, competitively in the paddock. Surely, during that, doing that due diligence that they must have had to do, you those are the things you they're the first things you pick up aren't they that you have to go back to the square one and back to the drawing board and and look at what other teams are doing and take on those kind of principles and it seems like they haven't done that i, I totally agree with you um hazel i think it's um it feels like they've come in expecting their former success to be enough to come in and work in this championship i honestly think that when they had their disastrous partnership with dragon which was disastrous and like there's lots of things you can look at Dragon and say there are so many things operationally wrong with them as a Formula E team and like you're dead right. Um, but 
um, the the partnership with Dragon seems to have done almost exactly the same thing that that Audi's partnership with Ab Schaeffler did, which is bizarre because it, like these are opposite ends of the success spectrum. Um, but uh, they basically seem to go like, well, they're essentially quite unprofessional. So if we bring all of our like being a factory professional team rigidity, yeah. yeah this will be what works. Like the problem is that there's a lack of discipline and it's like, no, that's absolutely not what the problem is. The problem is that there's operational loose ends and operational rigidity is the opposite of like how you could tie up those loose ends. And the, like, yeah, I, I feel that they've essentially had the same year that Audi did when they first became a factory team. And to some extent that BMW did last year uh, last season when they became a factory team um uh basically when they were like right let's do this properly now and then i was like you can't do it properly like this is not like other series you can't yeah. you yeah. can't impose that model i mean we could talk about this all night oh. guys <laughs> there's so much to go through but let's move it back to the race that we had today so another good performance from lotterer hazel i think we're running out of time to do your glowing <laughs> report of lotterer's race day can i read out my three points that i've written now i will allow it <laughs> <laughs> okay so i I've, I've i've got notes um and my nice things to say about andre lotterer today uh, that he was second in group two by our only Roland, who eventually took pole, so that's very good. Um, he showed mature racecraft in going forwards uh, from his starting position of seventh to then be dueling with the, the top um, four or uh, uh, three drivers eventually, as it was. And he didn't, although he was running out of energy, plow through Rene Rass' car over the line. <laughs> wow. and that's Andre Lotter's report card <laughs> I, right well two other drivers that had a good race today both newbies in the grand scheme of things uh, was Alex Lynn he's obviously there as Pascal Verlein's replacement and Mahindra he had another very strong quality performance today um, and managed to get P5 which is great given you know Mahindra's energy issues that they've, they've suffered um, and Tom Blomqvist, who uh, replaced James Collado, I know on the last podcast we mentioned that that could have been Collado's last race. The very next day he confirmed it. Um, he has other racing commitments, so Tom Blomqvist took his place. Um, great job for him to get into Super Bowl. Um, and he was running in the points on in the top 10 just about for most of the race, but unfortunately slipped to 12th um, for the end of the race. So no points for him, but hopefully he can have some more success tomorrow. Um, who had a bad day? Well, I mean, this is kind of self-explanatory. Basically, everybody like De Costa, De Grassi, Vern. Uh, but when we, he managed to go from P22 up to the top 10 to 10th position, which is good from him. Um, but yeah, those guys obviously starting at the back without giving a qualifying time meant that they struggled for the day. Gunter, obviously previous race winner. Um, I've lost track of days now, but last week. <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. Sunday, yeah. Yeah, that's it. He um, was hit by Degrassi early on and suffered a puncture. Um, same with Bird involved in a first lap pileup. Um, so he lost a lot of time in the Saturday. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody <sighs> sort of got their head screwed on. <laughs> yeah, uh, G Gunther has got a win. Uh, so didn't Gunther have um, in these five races um, two non scores, win two non scores? Yeah, which is a, um, a very we, bizarre run. In theory, it means tomorrow we'll be a win. Yeah, this season, of he only scores if he is on the podium. Yeah, he's Otherwise, either first or second, or bust. No way. <laughs> yeah, does, or, all or bust. Right. Well, let's. And they've been calling him Electro Shumi, so I'd like to call him Electro Alonso. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we've talked a lot about possible drivers that might get contracts next year um, and those that have really wowed us, like Ollie, Ollie Rowland with the win today. Um, but guys, who is your driver of the day? Mark, let's start with you as our, our podcast guest. 
I mean, I think it's going to sound boring, but I think Roland, uh, you can't fault anything he did. Um, you could argue that his qualifying performance was helped by some of the, the weird stuff that happened earlier on. But from that point on, he didn't put a foot wrong. He did everything right. Um, and it's, you can look at it and say, well, he was on pole. It's easy from there. It isn't because you still have to do everything right. And, and we've seen people throw it away from pole so many times. So I'm going to say Ollie Rowland thoroughly deserved it today. Driver of the day for me. Rob, how about you? Who's your driver of the day? Um, just to mix it up, I'm going to give it to Rene Rast um, because I thought uh, his quality lap was mega and I thought his um, DTM style driving on the last lap was was really exciting and um yeah just i just love the 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 ruthfulness uh ruthlessness that's easy easy to say isn't it ruthlessness of his um you know his his pouncing on that opportunity to grab that podium um i, I really thought that was impressive given uh, how new he is i mean i know he is it wasn't his debut in the series he, he did a race like four years ago or something like that you really I mean you can't that counts for nothing he only uh, did the, laps as well exactly he yeah and he was that. in the Aguri wasn't he so um but yeah I think he's been um pretty pretty solid in that Audi and today um yeah he gets my my nod for driver of the day and Hazel what about you uh Mick Evans um yeah. who has been a bit of a sort of like quiet spot but Mitch has had the most horrific, he came into Tempelhof um, 11 points behind Antonio Felix Costa. He's still in group one tomorrow, somehow, because of how big his points haul was up until then. Um, but like he hasn't scored for the majority of the races so far. Um, and he has looked like pretty destroyed a lot of the time. Um, but today he managed to go from 13th, which is not a great qualifying position, but he was one of the, the two, like Max Gunter, who was able to set a lap in Group 1. Um, so he didn't go out 15 hours too late. Um, and uh, he fought his way up to 7th. Um, you know, I, I haven't actually looked at the notes board for a minute. He might be even higher up. Um, and to, to gain seven places in a former E race is actually pretty like, impressive. And to do that off the back of quite how bad it's been mm. and to just sort of pull yourself together and, and from the midfield, which, you know, 13th in Formula E, there's 24 cars. That's you, you, you are literally in the middle of the field. Um, like, yeah, there's always a bit of chaos and, and whatnot. And it was a messy race. Uh, in that respect so like yeah I think I think Mitch holding his head together and, and just being able to do that and do it cleanly and and not end up caught and stuff and not end up bunched up and and um, use his attack mode and his fan boost really sensibly it, it basically wasn't shown on the telly but he used his attack mode and his fan boost um, way before the top six did um, so that he could just move forward to a safe space and he was then running in sort of like relatively clean air behind them um, and could wait to see if anything happened with them. And if not, he was in a pretty good position to just take home a solid points haul uh, compared to a woeful performance in Templehof so far. And yeah. I, I think that's quite nice to see for both him and Jaguar. Yeah, well, I'm going to take your 13th to 7th and raise you. My drive of the day would be Buemi, who started P22 and finished 10th. So, I mean, guaranteed, I don't think the one extra championship point he gets is going to make much of a difference. But still, for um, a drive to, you know, get through the field as well as he did, that will be my driver of the day. Um, but that's it for this episode, I'm afraid. Many thanks to Mark and also to Hazel and Rob for their time. Mark, before we let you go, um, how can people follow you and where is best for everybody to find out about you and your work? Well, thanks very much. Um, yeah, if you search, uh, well, at F1 Elvis is uh, all of my socials, so you can get me on there. And uh, same on YouTube, you'll find me by searching F1 Elvis on YouTube, where I do most of my stuff. Uh, but that'd be great. Thank you very much for having me today. It's been great. No worries. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been excellent. You've been a, an amazing guest. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. 
Um, well, guys, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. I can't actually believe tomorrow is going to be the last one of our post-race podcast. It just seems crazy. This has gone oh, I'm, I'm so I'm so ready for that to be the last race. <laughs> I really like how the two editors just like simultaneously inhaled, exhaled. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, these these podcasts i mean they've been a lot of fun but i mean when i had the crazy idea guys should we do it one podcast for every race and let's do it on the night i didn't fast forward to actually the time taken to um you know write all the the notes and the running order and then the editing process to get them all turned out and published each night and i haven't been to bed before 1am on a race night yet so I'm very happy tomorrow is the last race. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do video too, because like Zoom automatically spools out video. So if we're doing audio, we might as well do video. I mean, like, that's great. People love podcasts on YouTube. Um, uh, and I have to say, uh, the rendering process of video <laughs> means that I have not been to bed <laughs> before 3 a.m. On a oh, gosh. <laughs> well, yeah. you can't not listen to that and not want to get... <laughs> So if you're listening to this, please, please consider leaving us a review whilst you're there. Not only would Rob and Hazel love you forever, <laughs> but also it really does help other Formula E fans discover our content. Um, as I said earlier, Inside Electric is an independently run website. So please consider backing us on Patreon. And in return, you'll get some exclusive benefits, including additional bonus content, including a monthly Ask Us Anything video, early access to each and every podcast we release, plus access to the inside electric discord chat um we are back tomorrow for race six in berlin the final round of the 2019-20 season Ooh. and we'll also be joined on that one by bbc journalist neve lewis i have been your host katie fairman and this has been the inside electric podcast we'll catch you again for another episode tomorrow <laughs> Yay.